this is a good book, and I think I think a lot of people are, are drawn to to meet the guy who wrote it. So I really appreciate you taking the time to come in. I guess yeah, my pleasure. Ten ten people's enough to kick it off, and and we'll we'll keep doing intros as people stream in. Sounds good. Having said all that, maybe I don't need to introduce Cole very much, but he's uh, he's a guy. He's Mister ADU in Portland, I think. Uh, he he's the editor of a volunteer-run website, AccessoryDwellings.org, and uh, the author of this really good book, Backdoor Revolution, um, which is a, a great guide to both homeowners and professionals who are thinking about the ADU space. And he runs the ADU Open House up in Portland, where you can see ADUs. He, he's got a tiny house hotel up there, and like mm. just a, a wealth of knowledge. Uh, really glad to have him on and introduce them to all of you guys, because you're all thinking about ADUs in your own space and thinking about the new environment in California where it's become so much easier to, to tackle this kind of project. So thank you so much for coming, Cole. Thank you guys yeah. for attending. Um, I think the big thing about, we'll, we'll start with the book, is that it's yeah. got two cool parts. The first part is all for homeowners. The second part's all for professionals. And, and uh, if you guys have any questions to start off, I'd love to start with your questions. If we ever get quiet, I'll, I'll take the mic back up. But what do you guys want to hear? Feel free to type in the chat or unmute yourself and speak. You can raise your hand if it gets too crazy, if you want to be called on. But please, uh, what have you guys come to talk about and hear about? Um, I, I want to find out, you know, what's the best process from start to finish? You know, yeah. we're, we're really at a disadvantage because we don't know anything about what how to start this and and for it to everything to work out in the benefit of the homeowners and everybody else is involved you know because you have to get design plans you got to do all this surveying and all this kind of stuff and so for a newbie where do you start <laughs> yeah and that's like it's a really good question it's kind of like the whole my whole shtick is is really like helping homeowners and R ryan might have you know that might kind of be your focus too but um it is a really complicated daunting overwhelming um process and so i don't you know like I, i'm pretty straight up about that that this is not an easy process for a lot of people myself included um and there's companies that are out there now that are especially in the bay area that are helping to make the pro or at least they're trying theoretically to make the process a lot easier <laughs> but i won't sugarcoat it um and i will say it is an extremely difficult process it is extremely expensive it's arguably the second most challenging thing you'll ever do in your life after having a child and it's going to take a year at least and it's going to be incredibly stressful and on the, on the flip side, it's going to be life-changing and totally worth it once you're done. But it's kind of like giving birth to a really challenging child or something. Um, so as far as, like, first step, <laughs> as far as first steps, I'd say that, you know, the order of things that I think about are understanding roughly what we're talking about in terms of ultimate price point of what the unit that you're going to be going for is, which sounds preemptive because we don't like without knowing your situation i can't project whether it's going to be a fifty thousand dollar internal conversion of an existing structure or new new detached adu so but but that's kind of like you know in, in the first minute of my conversation with you i'd say well are you talking about a garage conversion basement conversion new construction detached new construction and once you say that you, you're probably going to say detached new construction because most people are looking at that then i'm going to say okay we're talking about a price point of roughly 200,000 bucks in the Bay Area for the cheapest ADU you can build, maybe as much as 350, 400 for a nice high-end 1,000 square foot detached ADU. That's a lot of money. Um, and so the very first order of business is financing. Before you get into design, zoning, anything like that, let's think about how, how is it possible for you to get enough money to do something that's gonna cost $200,000. You definitely don't have $200,000, nobody does saved up, most people don't. If you did, you probably wouldn't be building an AD with it, rather you'd be investing it in hedge funds or something. So my presumption is you're a middle class person and just like everybody else, you don't have $200,000 lying around. So you have to figure out somehow with your meager savings of $5,000 or $10,000, how are you gonna turn that into a $200,000 unit? And, and there's generally, a, a, there's a whole number of different approaches to financing, but the first order of business is kind of that. 
that nugget that you know dealing with financing and then it's kind of looking into um at the same time or maybe concurrently zoning issues and what what are going to be like the zoning red flag issues that you might come up against and th that's the stuff that you can do as a homeowner and i would you know recommend you do as a homeowner before necessarily involving other people and then and then starting to maybe once you've gotten to that first set of zoning questions about what size what are the setbacks things like that like you know beverly you're like okay i know i want a 1000 square foot adu i know i want it to be two bedrooms because it's for this i want it to be for rental income that's going to be the best return on investment so given that um I'm ready now, now that I know I have a budget of say $300,000, I figured out how I'm gonna finance this thing, I know what the zoning entitlements are on my property, more or less, I'm ready to reach out to a designer. Except I would say, don't reach out to a designer, rather reach out to a builder. Um, a builder is, are the, is the um, generally speaking, when people are going through a development process, <clears throat> the conventional wisdom would be, go to a designer, get a set of drawings drawn up, shop it around for the cheapest bid, from three general contractors, get the cheapest bid and execute. Do not do that. I'd say it's a, not a good method for building an ADU. Instead, reach out to a, a builder. Try to find builders that you want to work with because ultimately you're going to have a really trans, a really in, uh, long depth, personal, in depth um, relationship with the builder more so than with the designer. And they're the ones who are really going to know how much this project is ultimately going to cost. So you come to them and you say, I want to do a 1,000 square foot ADU. I'm I've got $200,000, I'm ready to go. The builder's gonna say, well, that's cool, except $200,000 isn't enough unless you're willing to do a 500 square foot ADU. I can do a 500 square foot ADU for $200,000, but I can't do a 1,000 square foot ADU. So all of a sudden you have to go back to the drawing board and say, okay, I don't have $300,000, I only have 200, so maybe I can't do my two bedroom ADU, I have to do a studio style one bedroom, you know, two, maybe a small one bedroom or a studio style ADU. That's gonna change my entire scope. Um, or alternatively, you could say, well, in the, in the, in the course of my inv investigation to the financing, I realized I actually am eligible for a construction loan of $300,000 or $200,000 plus I can borrow some money from mom or aunt or uncle and do a 5%, you know, handshake loan from them. And that's how I'm going to get up to $300,000 because I realized in the course of doing my initial research with Ryan and with Cole, it's going to be a lot of money. So I wanted to find a contingency plan for getting $300,000, which is ridiculously expensive, but that's what I need in order to build the kind of ADU that's gonna work best on my property. And then, so it's not like a scientific process to this stuff, but in general, the, the, the way that I think about these things is like costs, concurrently like big zoning, red flags, things like um, if you're in an HOA, guess what? That's gonna change everything. Um, you might not be able to build an ADU at all based on the CCNRs of the zoning. Or maybe the sewer on your property, maybe you're on septic and in order to do an ADU, you're gonna have to add an additional septic capacity on your site and that's gonna cost $20,000 and that's gonna change your ultimate budget that you can dedicate to the ADU. So that's gonna change your scope. So there's a lot of kind of like dancing around back and forth between the design development cost permitting stuff that you need to figure out and it all needs to happen kind of together. And so the, the you know, because of this degree of complication, I'd say, you know, self-servingly, I'd say you want to kind of try to get educated about all these different things to some extent. And you can do that through reading the first half of my book, which is for homeowners or taking my online web course. And I'm sure Ryan has some other ideas on this front too, that I'll let him chime in about, but, um, but I say all those things are kind of important fa factors that would help you kind of get started. Now, jumping to where I started this whole thing is if all that sounds daunting, overwhelming, you're like, I don't, I have no idea what Cole was just saying. It made no sense. I have no interest in this. I just want an ADU, damn it. I call these, the just, just give me an ADU, damn it, people, of which, you know, that's 25% of the people who want to build ADUs is probably just give me an ADU, damn it. I don't want to go through all this complicated stuff that you're talking about. There's companies out there that can help you with that, um, and you know they're kind of in the um, one-stop shop, prefab ADU. We'll take care of everything for you kind of uh, realm. There's a lot of new companies that are offering that service in the Bay Area, so maybe I'll I'll hand it over over to Ryan to like chime in with some ideas about that. Yeah, no, that's that's exactly. I was gonna plug the book for the DIY crowd, like. 
it helps to have a resource you can go back to because there is so much hopping between subjects. And when you hit a wall, you go, actually, I need to, I, I thought I was going forward with finance, but it turns out every underwriter is changing the rules now because of what's going on um, with, with COVID and, and all the relief efforts. Let me pause my finance work and go back to design. And, and you, want a, you want a resource that you can trust that you can hop back and forth between. And then, like you said, if, it, if it's daunting, you know, that's one of the things that I get referral uh, uh, commissions for is introducing homeowners to uh, one-stop shop companies like Buildzig, who have also done webinars and will be back at the end of the, the month. Um, and their, their specialty is like, let, let me visit the property, then let me tell you what your options are. They're, here's your cheapest, and it's not gonna be cheap. And here's your, your kind of all the trimmings options. And here's what you can do with prefab. Here's what you could do with custom construction. And, and if you want, we can apply for the permits for you. We can take it all the way to construction if you want. And, and those kind of one-stop shops can be really helpful if you can afford them. Um, and if you don't want to stomach the, the, the constant quest, if you do want to learn and do it on your own, you know, Cole's got a, a class just for that. And, uh, and I'll send a link around in the follow-up email after the webinar um, because it's, every ADU project is unique and everybody's at a different stage and you just need to find the thing that you're comfortable with uh, that's going to get you a project you can afford and, you know, that you can enjoy on, on budget and on time. Great question. I think, okay, we've got some questions in the chat. Do you want uh, me to read some of those to you, Cole? Yeah. Cool. Um, so Aaron asked, uh, is there value to doing these as flips, uh, as real estate investments? Um, do, how do people evaluate the value of, a, of an ADU? Oh, have I frozen? Yeah, and that, that's like the $24,000 question. And to just, go ahead. Um, that's the $24,000 question and there's no answer to it yet, unfortunately, so that's the bottom line. But um, I'll, with that said, I'll, I'll give you a lot of contextual information to that simple answer. So um, valuation studies of the after rehab value of properties with ADUs um, are being conducted now in Portland for the first time. And we're the only place in the country where that is possible because we have enough requisite legacy ADU stock and inventory to actually make quantitative, statistically valid assessments of what the contributory value of an ADU is to the resale value of a property because it doesn't make sense to build an ADU and then sell the property or does it? Um, my conjecture, my hypothesis is it does not. It's not a good short-term investment. Instead, if you were to build a $200,000 ADU on your property, and sell that property the next day, you would lose money on that deal. That would be a bad investment. Therefore, we don't see speculative developers building ADU. We don't see flippers buying a single family house, building an ADU and selling that property. They would lose money. They'll go out of business the next day. That would be a really bad decision. At least that's what I think. And um, and I say that, I couch that because in talking with people in the California, in the Bay Area market in particular, They've pushed back on that sentiment. They've I've talked to really well-established builders who are like, no, if you add 500 square feet of habitable living space in San Francisco, you can actually, you can absolutely capture that value back in the resale immediately. I strongly disagree with that. I don't believe that's true, but I, I'm open to the idea that I could be totally wrong. It's possible that there's so much differentiation in the local real estate economics and dynamics of a market that they could be right. And, and in fact, it is a good short-term investment, but that's absolutely not the case in Portland. You, it, it, as a general rule of thumb, you might say that adding an ADU is going to add roughly, at least in the Portland market, 50% of what it costs to build. So if, a, if you have the $200,000 ADU, which is like the statistical average all-in cost, $210,000 for an 800 square foot ADU for design, build, permitting, utility connections, and construction, that might add maybe 100000 bucks of resale value. Don't, don't like quote me on that number. I'm just giving you kind of a general sense of what it might be worth. So that's the dry, that's the downside, and uh, that's like it doesn't sound like it's a good investment on on its surface. But that's not why you build an ADU. You do not you, you do not do it for short term investment, and so um, you do it for you do it for the rental income that it can generate. If you're interested in this for financial reasons as opposed to like extra living space for multi generational family households, 
you want to hold on to that property for at least five years, probably eight years, 10 years in order for it to recoup and pay off that initial investment. And then it's all just cash money after that. So um, in some markets, um, I know that uh, Ryan's colleagues who are presenting on, on this stuff are more, I would say, sophisticated in the, in the financing and lending space than I am. Um, but I will say that um, as much as people like to model out what they think these things will be worth, I think the real, the, 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 the real only way, if you talk to an appraiser or a real estate professional, the only way you actually know what the real value is, it's not modeling it, it's actually looking at sales comps. And there aren't sales comps in California of properties with ADUs because ADUs are such a new phenomena, it's just not, um, there's not gonna be a lot of them for sale. And the market is so new that there isn't a sophisticated enough buying pool, a large enough buying pool that would be looking for that type of property that would actually be able to assign as much value as it might actually be worth in real life because it's under misunderstood or the real estate, the re rental income potential of that secondary unit is not quite understood. It, just to put it out that another way, like if you were to get a thousand dollars of rental income a month off of the unit, that's maybe equivalent to a $200,000 mortgage. So it effectively, if you're buying a property with an ADU, you could also think to yourself, another way you could think about it is I can afford a $200,000 more expensive property than I would otherwise be able to afford because it has an ADU on it. Of course, you as a homeowner won't necessarily be able to qualify for an additional $200,000 um, of, of buying power just because you understand that you can get rental income doesn't mean the bank will believe it. Um, and the banks aren't necessarily willing to attribute additional uh, mortgage buying power to you just because you have an ADU that you think you'll be able to rent. Rather, they need to see two years of qualified rental income and they'll count 75% of that rental income towards a uh, future, uh, towards a mortgage in the future, but that's, that's a different topic. Bottom line is if you're building an ADU, as a general matter, it's not a good short-term investment. I wouldn't recommend it for flippers. The, 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 the only way that I, that I can say for sure it's going to work is if you hold on to the property for a long period of time. And now that there isn't an owner occupancy requirement in California for at least five years, um, you can buy a property and hold on to that property and rent out both units. And then it absolutely makes sense, just as much sense as it would for a homeowner developing an ADU and holding on to it. Most developers, flippers, aren't interested in buying and holding. Uh, their financial model isn't premised on that. But I'm suggesting, well, you shouldn't be building ADUs and maybe you should be considering getting into a new business model because you know, that, that's the way that it can make sense is to hold that property and it makes a lot of sense. Um, or alternatively, uh, in the, you can't do this in California, but in Oregon, Washington, and other states, you can conduize. Um, and so conduization is another mechanism by which you can do a short term in the property improvement such as an ADU and then subdivide the property essentially and sell off each parcel or sell off each unit independently. But you can't do that in California, so we'll skip that topic. So bottom line is there isn't really a, a simple way for a flipper to get into ADU space in terms of, uh, and have it be a profitable endeavor. Now there might be philanthropic ways you could do it and just cover your costs, but it's not gonna be a, a super lucrative endeavor. Um, there might be other nifty things that you could consider though, such as, buying a house and maybe building the, um, getting the plans. This is, I wouldn't actually recommend this, approach, but just, just for your consideration, think of something like this. Getting a set of plans put together, getting a set of permits for it, selling the property with a $10,000, $20,000 premium with that understanding in mind that you have pre-approved plans ready to go and that you as the flipper can add this ADU at, you know, a, a pretty good, you know, a decent margin, you know, say you'd add it, like if your cost to a retail customer would be $200,000 for that ADU, you could say, well, I'll do it for 180 if you want me to build it. And so, I mean, that's one, I'm, I'm not, I'm not exactly, I haven't thought through exactly how this will all work, but there might be a way to like add value by creating the, the perception of the fact that they can have an ADU on this property without too much difficulty. And you can maybe generate some potential, business model from that. No, that's great. That's, that's a very thorough answer. I think it's fair. It's like passive income is a proven thing. Flipping, it's not proven. And, and when you're saying Portland has enough 
uh, inventory to do comparables and to, to look at the stats, you guys are at like 1% adoption. Is, is that right? 2% as of like last year. Yeah. Nice. So, yeah. so like when, when flippers start to see like 2% adoption in California, then maybe you can start looking at comps and think, yeah, the real estate market might start pricing these things in, but we're yeah. away. It took, it took Portland years to get there. Right. Yeah. Hard and it, yeah, it's, I mean, it's going to, it's going to pick up a lot quicker in California than it did in Oregon because, um, we've kind of ironed out the system, so to speak. Like we, we have the industry best practices kind of known, like just as a, as a way of explaining like how inculcated this ADU stuff is into the like real estate market or just like the understanding here. So I'd say like finger in the wind grass, like 75% of people who own homes in Portland have, um, no, I'd say 90% of homeowners probably know what an ADU is. 75%, 50 to 75% have probably strongly considered adding one on their property. Um, and I'd say 10 to 20% are planning to build an ADU on their property in the next few years. At least they think they are. They, what, you know, what's one thing for people to say that they are, it's another thing for people to actually do it. But we actually have a survey that shows 14% of people said they're going to build an ADU in the next five years. So, so it's really built into the market now. Conversely, you know, I'd say the no, the name recognition of ADU in California is probably going to be 5% or something really low. It'll probably pick up to like 20%, 30% in the next year. Um, it'll be quick, but um, but it's it's still a pretty novel concept. Um, but California is like the best market definitely in the country for ADUs at this point. So, um, so I think it's going to become, it's going to, be a really rapidly evolving space, which is, which is really exciting. Um, um, and, uh, it, you know, but yeah, leave it at that. Cool. I think uh, you also spoke to one of Victor's questions where he, he was asking if lenders count ADU square footage as living square footage and, and whether they really loan um, a, a later follow-up. He said, do, do you, do you, do you, can, you um, can you get loans based on for cash out refis or HELOCs? and prefabs based on the square footage of the ADU. And, and that's something you kind of addressed. Could you, could you talk about Yeah, that? so I, I um, th again, this is kind of getting into stuff that might get a little bit over my skis in terms of sophistication on the answer. But I, I mean, I, I know the, the answer to this in the Portland market, but I don't want to overstep my expertise. I'll save you in, in California. In the, in the California <laughs> market, okay. So in the, in the Portland market, it doesn't matter what your square footage is, really. I mean, that matters in some ways, but when a, an appraiser is looking at a property, the square footage is a factor, but it's not the way an ADU isn't gonna be evaluated on that front. Rather, it's gonna be evaluated on like the fact that it's a three bedroom, two bath with a secondary detached unit that's one bedroom, one bath. Um, whether it's a 300 square, you know, 500 square foot ADU or 800 square foot ADU is maybe some, somewhat less relevant in that there isn't the degree of granularity for sales comps, even in the Portland market, to be able to say, oh, 500 square foot ADU is going to add X amount and an 800 square foot ADU will add this amount. It's just not, we just don't have that degree of granularity. So, um, so it's a little bit of a gut. Of gut Thing that realtors have to do when they're pricing out what a property is worth. They're oftentimes coming to me and I'm like, I don't know. Like you, you just take your best guess, I guess. And maybe, you know, just like you would list something on Craigslist for if you're selling a product or selling a rent, a unit or renting a unit, rent listed at 1500 bucks a month. If there's no responses, you drop it down to 1300 bucks a month. Then maybe you get a couple bites and you don't get enough and you will drop down to $1,200 a month and get enough bites. That's how I'd probably go about listing a property with an ADU. Now, it, as far as figuring out, you know, wh where we want lending and financing to go is ultimately to, for a lender to not only look at the future value of a property with an ADU, but also to look at the rental income potential of that property as far as a mechanism to uh, ensure that your debt to income ratio is sufficient to um, allow you to get that large loan that you're otherwise not qualified to get. Right now, there aren't lending programs for the most part in the United States that do that. 
um, but um, but we're incrementally moving in that direction. Um, what does exist now and you can do today is call a bank like Umqua, which serves California, and say, I would like to get an ADU renovation loan, and a, con a renovation loan, and I'm gonna be building an ADU on it. And that is a loan that looks at the after rehab value. Again, it gets back to this appraisal question. So you have this $500,000 property, you're gonna be building this two 800 square foot ADU, and you could get a loan that would be for the future value of the property, but we don't know what that future value is, and there isn't going to be a lot of sales come. So it's going to be a little bit of a squirrely game for a year. It's just like kind of a rite of passage that every jurisdiction is going to have to go through as they're getting to this stage. But but let's just say for the sake of this conversation, the, you you're working with Umqua. They know what ADUs are. They've done a lot of AU construction loans already. They're going to say, yeah, you're going to add value to this property. We're going to say it's going to be worth 600000 bucks. And we will therefore pay off your first bridge loan, your, your first construction loan, then we will give you a cash out refinance essentially, except we're gonna hold that additional money in escrow, that additional $100,000 of the, what, what, what is accounting for that future value of the property. We're gonna hold that money in escrow and we're gonna give that to your builder during each phase of construction. And so that's kind of a construction loan or renovation loan process. It's a lot more of a, uh, it's, a, it's, a it's a pain in the butt, um, it's administratively tricky, a lot of red tape, it's more work, but it's the one and only mechanism for you to actually be able to afford an ADU that you otherwise couldn't afford. So it's a really good option. And I, I'm gonna personally try to use a renovation loan on my next um, ADU to see whether I can put in zero dollars of my own money and build an ADU with it, just as an experiment um, to see whether that's uh, what that's like, because I wanna try it firsthand. I can say in Portland, it's becoming an increasingly popular way to do it. I'd still say it represents like probably less than 10% of the market as far as how people are financing it use. Most people are using a combination of home equity lines of credit, cash out refinancing based on your current market value, family, save, uh, family loans, credit cards, cash savings, 401k loans, and sweat equity. It's usually a combination of those different mechanisms. But, um, there are now a number of different lenders um, who are doing innovative loan products in the California market. There's probably 10 or so, um, 10 or so different organizations that are trying explicitly to reach people who wouldn't otherwise be able to afford building an ADU. And so I would look into those, for example, Housing Trust Silicon Valley has a program, um, LA Moss down in LA does a program. There's different programs all, I'm sure, I think there's uh, there's a couple other options out there in the Bay Area. So um, I, I linked to them um, a, a, a suite of different innovative financing options that are available on my latest post on buildinganadu.com. If you want to check that out, I can- I'll include that in the- Yeah, you, wanna, email. You, you know the link I'm talking about, Ryan? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yeah, the Casito Coalition put it together. Um, so, um, so that's a, a long winded answer to your easy question. <laughs> no, it's a good answer. It's a great answer. And I think uh, just to stress, uh, somebody asked how to spell Umqua. So I put that in the chat. It's a beautiful river. It's a beautiful, <laughs> it's a, it's a, a good Pacific Northwest bank. And then um, I like, I just, I talked to three underwriters at Redwood Credit Union yet, just yesterday. And like, you know, uh, well, A, they don't all know what an ADU is, but after you describe it, they go, oh, granny flats. Yeah, we, we do stuff with that. And, and then they all have a different take on it, right? Because they're, they're coming at it. One underwriter is a specialist in a home equity line of credit. One's in a construction loans and, 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 the, and then there's commercial loans. And, and none of them are at Redwood are ready to, to give you um, the future value of the passive income but they're open to it, right? And they get that it's going to happen. Yeah. And so they're looking for groups that can, can prove it for them. And like you say, every jurisdiction's got to have its kind of baby steps. Groups like the one that Renee, uh, who's also in the chat, works with, hopefully that they can, they can make some major headway uh, with these credit unions, local credit unions and banks, uh, so that the counties uh, get over the, the first step because um, it will make it so much easier. But in the meantime, chapter three of the book, all about financing. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll send that link around too with some, some, I think there's some hard money on there, like uh, lenders as well as conventional lenders. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's honestly like, I, th I think financing, I, I, I like to say now that 
financing isn't actually a real barrier in the sense that there are mechanisms to do ADU development for almost anybody now, but you, but they're not easy. They're there um, if you know where to look. Um, there, there. It, it just as one example of that, there's companies now that will literally build your ADU and pay for it themselves and they'll cover all the costs and they'll just give you a little bit of the rental income. I'm not suggesting that's a good idea, for, but but it, it, it just proves the fact that there's now a way for you to build an ADU on your property, even if you don't have the money to do it. And so, and then there's a whole lot of kind of, you, what, what you'll probably witness is it's going to be these really small local credit unions operating in California that are able to do more innovative financing options than any other banks first. So even Umqua, I'd say, which is the biggest bank in the country, as far as the number of ADU construction loans that, are, that, that they're processing, they're not that easy to work with relative to, or I should say their underwriting standards aren't as good as a local bank and credit union that has like one or two branches um, who are willing to, uh, they don't farm out their loans to Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, so they're not securitized in, uh, uh, by that, by that government-sponsored entity, and therefore they have more flexibility with their underwriting standards because they're using portfolio loans. Most of you probably have no idea what I'm talking about this loan, but if you do, um, just uh, what it means is like a local bank and credit union is likely to have a better, more flexible product that you can potentially utilize more so than like going to Bank of America. Bank of America is absolutely never going to have a product for you, nor will any national bank. So don't even bother asking a national bank. Good, good advice. All right, uh, change of topic. Crescencia uh, has asked a, a question. I, I look forward to hearing uh, a couple different perspectives on it. I think, can ADUs be listed on Airbnb and other vacation rental? Is it, is it a long-term thing only or can you do vacation rental? Well, I mean, I, I know that in California, you're not allowed to list out a standard ADU as a short-term rental that is 30 days or less, um, Airbnb. So, and from my vantage, I think that's fine. Um, but obviously, you know, there's there's an interesting tension with ADUs and, and, and short-term rental in that one of the reasons that people want ADUs is one of the biggest reasons is that it provides flexible living space so that you can use it for whatever you want. Like you can use it for guests from out of town and family members and an office space during coronavirus. You can shelter in place and you can have a uh, visitor stay for a month at a time. And then in the in-between periods, you can use Airbnb. Beautiful, wonderful. Um, except you can't do that now in all of California and you can't do that in um, a lot of jurisdictions that allow ADUs because they don't want you to build an extra housing unit. They don't want to give you that entitlement unless you're willing to help pitch in to solve the affordable housing crisis, which is putting that house into the long-term rental housing stock. So I, I kind of like side with the civic perspective on that. I guess I'm willing to make that concession that as long as the AD regulations are good, that that's a fair trade-off that it can't be used for short-term rental. I think there is an exception to the rule. I'm not positive, again, don't call me on this, but I think if it's a J junior ADU, you can use it for short-term rental in California. Does anybody wanna double check me on that one? I'm not sure. I'm not, does anybody else in the room know? Uh, the, uh, but no, I'm, I'm not sure. That's cool, okay. I'll look it up. I literally <laughs> read about this recently and can't remember what the answer was. <laughs> yeah, and junior well, ADUs are kind of this mysterious, Thing that only exists in California, of which there are no real junior ADUs in existence yet, as far as I can tell, or very, very, very few. Um, maybe somebody on the call has seen one, but I haven't. I haven't even heard of somebody who's seen one. So, um, but it's something. And Napa, uh, Napa has J ADUs. They have a program for it. Have you seen is, any real physical in person? Yes. Examples? Yes. How yes. many? They've, I don't know the numbers, but I've seen photos and I've seen a few. They have been yeah. focusing them for. Um, senior, senior income, uh, it's a hit, you know, hit it and quit it project, maybe cost 50,000 or less to retrofit an existing building to include the JADU. Yeah, and I'll just, just a little cautionary note. Um, so that's great. I'm glad you've seen some real, real ones. June and there's some in Sonoma County as well. There's what? There are some in Sonoma County as well. Yeah. Okay, so 
But I guess just to be clear, I think we've all, I've heard about them and I've seen images and magazines that could be them, but that, that's a different matter than seeing, you know, knowing firsthand of somebody who's built one. So I, yeah. I, it, but, but that's great. I'm glad that you have seen some in real life or heard of some and being built in real life because I haven't. I've been like- they're, they're not, they're, 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 we just call them JADUs, but what they are, are the attached yeah. So basically, it's whatever the existing building envelope is, and you have carved out space. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and it's, it's uh, a good. That's it's, that's all it is. There's no magic around it, but it's it's a nice, easy um, solution yeah. because it's so much cheaper if you can get it done. Right, and and, and so you know, we we would just call that an, an internal carve out ADU, and it's like limited to 500 square yeah, feet. Yeah, exactly. That's and, exactly what it is. And the reason that it's so rare, and that I believe. I, maybe will continue to be so rare is that um, an internal carve out EDU, um, actually it does make rational sense to do it in many cases because in theory it's a lot less expensive and you get an ADU out of it, but you're also explicitly in a deliberate, you know, removing habitable living space from your primary residence. And so, you know, and some, some people might say, well, I wouldn't want to take my perf perfectly good single family house and carve it up so it's not as functional as a single family house, but it, it should, Makes sense it works. Uh, I'll give you. I'll give you a perfect example. If you have yeah. a house on a hill, most likely the house steps down or go up the hill, so the living room is separate from the bedroom, and you typically have a basement. Yeah. And that basement has its own entry. Right. And so actually, the conversion of that that basement level or that lower level is easy because it already had a, its own independent exit. Yeah. Um, where it becomes a little bit tricky is where is your second exit for fire protection purposes, fire escape purposes. Um, and also in the older Victorian houses, they tend to be large, right? And as you get older, they become too large uh, for an older person. And so it's actually quite easy to carve out a space in some of those larger Victorian houses, which we still have a lot of, and the larger craftsmen. Totally. Yeah. And I, I think, I think it is, it, it's, I mean, we have basement ADUs here. Um, so, so just, just to uh, give a little bit of the, the reason why the junior ADU code is a little bit strange in California is um, number one, it comes along with an owner occupancy provision. So as opposed to all the rest of ADUs in California, if you do a junior ADU, this, the jurisdiction can put a, an occupancy requirement on the property, which really is like one of my big pet peeves. I really dislike owner occupancy requirements. So that's number one. Number two, you're limited to 500 square feet. So if you're doing like a 600 square foot ADU, that's a basement like you were suggesting on a hillside. Those are pretty common in, in Portland. But if it's less than 500 square feet, it's going to be classified as an ADU as opposed to a junior ADU. Um, and there's the, the, uh, the, the positive idea, at least what I conceptually understand about the junior ADU code is that allows you to um, not do as much utility separation as you would with uh, as you would with an ADU. In any event, um, all good points. Thanks, uh, June and Renee for chiming in there. Yeah, thanks, guys. It's always more fun when it's participatory. I think uh, it, it reminds me, again, of, I think, cool section of the book about some of the pitfalls if you are going to do a, a conversion. Uh, like Cole goes through the most common traps for uh, for a garage conversion, basement conversion, where the unexpected costs are and like adding egress windows on a basement or, uh, you know, all those kinds of just things that you that you learn by doing. Um, so another cool thing, if you're considering a conversion, really specific section in the book that I thought was super informative. Um, cool. And then let's, let's actually, go if I can just go riff on that for a second, there's a little, um, so I, again, this might differ in California, but um, the idea of a secondary exit is, and actually that's not required in Portland. Um, you can have, if you have a studio style ADU, you can literally just have one door in theory and no windows, and that would be adequate as far as a means of egress. Um, if you have a one bedroom, if you have a, a bedroom, then you have to have an egress window from that bedroom directly to the exterior. So sometimes one of the tricks that I'll do with homeowners is talk about how you design that space. So it's officially on paper, a studio style apartment. And as long as there is a eight foot, or I think it's like eight foot clearance, horizontal clearance to get from where you would sleep to where the front door is, you don't have to do any egress windows. So you could have, you could literally put it in like a 
a piece of furniture that would serve as a wall to create a one bedroom life space. So, so, so you get one of those cub units from Ikea that has a wall, a bank of one foot cubes and you could put clothing in there. And then that basically gives, gives a private space for the sleeping area. But then on paper, the plans that you submit show just unobstructed living space from your bed, where your bed might be, zero bedroom ADU to the front door. All of a sudden, there's no need for an egress window. Now, on the other side, you know, on the flip side, you would want to have, you do want to have lots of natural light in a basement unit. So, if you can afford it, and if the space allows for it, you should add extra egress windows just to get extra light, if not for egress itself. Very good. Um, there's another question in from Sylvia that's a bit about the uh, the specific laws about what HOAs can still do in California to deny you or limit you as a homeowner. Are you, are you up to, to, to answer in that? Yeah. Um, okay, so I'll give my best crack at it. So I think the California legislation requires, compels HOAs to allow for ADUs in theory. This has not yet been um, tested out. So there hasn't been litigation from an HOA of the, the uh, sorry, from a owner on a property with an HOA, HOA that wanted to build an ADU. I suspect the devil is going to be in the details and it's going to be extremely difficult to build an ADU in an HOA if they have CCNRs that make it challenging. I think it's going to be a long, drawn out, lit litigious process, I suspect, but I'm just speculating here. Um, but in paper anyway, they can't prevent you from building an ADU in an HOA. And I think I think if I if I was a homeowner and I was like, I just want an ADU and I happen to be in an HOA, I think the by far the easiest way to do that is gonna be to do an internal conversion of an existing portion of your permitted structure as opposed to building a new detached structure, accessory structure on the property. I think that's gonna run into a chainsaw of CCNRs that are gonna make it challenging for you. But if you're doing internal conversion, I think there's a very good chance that the, the HOA would not have much of a leg to stand on to stop you because you wouldn't be making any exterior alterations that would be that wouldn't cause it to be subject to the design standards of the HOA. Thank you. Okay, we're we're getting close to the end. I uh, I want to see maybe we can fit in a couple more. So you told you consulted on a lot of projects, right? People people ask you to come out and look at their property to decide if they can do an ADU and what they should what they should think about. Can you yeah. talk a bit about like the worst mistakes people make or the biggest surprises they have on those visits? Um, well, I'd say oftentimes uh, the the two big gotchas I'd say in general are people who think they can convert a structure that doesn't really have any chance of being converted and vastly undermining or under underestimating what it's going to cost. Those are the two big things that I come up against, all, you know, not all the time, but definitely frequently. And so a lot of my folk, a lot of my work over the last decade has been to like provide information about the actual real life cost of this stuff. So to dispel the myth that you can do this for 50,000 bucks. I mean, you can, I've seen a couple of ideas for $50,000 that are internal conversions, but Generally speaking, that's not a realistic number. You know, we're talking about, you know, an inexpensive garage conversion would be like a hundred thousand bucks anywhere in California. That would be like pretty inexpensive. Um, or basement conversion or whatever. Um, so the num you know, kind of being a little bit more realistic about the numbers and where we're talking about detached construction, it's a lot more expensive up front. So that's that's kind of the big myth that um I work on dispelling oftentimes in um in the consults. But um um, other than that, I'd say just maybe um, being as knowledgeable as possible on the upfront, on the front end of all this work is helpful, knowing a lot. And that's why I was, I, I hesitate to say that that's like, a recommendation but I mean that's why that's why I have the book so that you can hopefully spend the time to read it but you know understanding that that's not going to work not everybody wants to do that there are now ways to do it without that I just I think that there's enough opportunities of things to do with your property that are vastly better than what you might get if you go with something off the shelf just as one illustration of that 
if you were converting your garage, which I'm a big fan of, you are going to lose a lot of storage space that is incredibly valuable to you, whether or not you realize it, that's where you keep your paint cans and your bikes and your canoes and your garbage cans and your, but, and your car maybe and luggage and stuff. And so in the course of building an ADU, you need to figure out where you're gonna store all that stuff. And it might make sense in the same time that you have people out there doing carpentry for them to build a, a shed on site on your property. And so kind of thinking about that in, in terms of the scope of work so that you don't end up having to hire a new company to come out and build you a 200 square foot of shed after you're done because you didn't realize, oh my God, I had 200 square feet of storage needs for my property. That's the kind of thing. It's like no builder who's coming out to your site is going to like build that into their um, how to build an ADU or sorry, how, how, like one-stop shop ADU thing. But as a, as if, if you understand what your property is going to be like once there's two households living on it, you might think about that and you might have to incorporate that development of that shed into your permit and then also build that into your total projected cost of doing your project. So there's, again, getting back to this idea, there's kind of some, re, you know, iterative elements to this initial uh, brainstorming phase that really uh, it behooves you to kind of think about all these different facets together to the as good as you can and kind of being strategic about making sure you're crossing all of your uh, coming up with these contingency plans for different factors as they change over time. I think good segue for like there's a wealth of information out there. It pays off to to know it before you get into this project. And you got two paths. You can either learn it all on your own, in which case I put a link to Cole's website and his class in the chat. I think those are both great places to start. Books, 25 bucks, 28 bucks, something like that. Um, great resource to start things off. Um, if, you, if you want to take the class, normally it's $300. Cole's extending a, a $100 discount, so it's $199 for anybody who's attended the webinar. And thank you very much, Cole. That's really awesome. Mm -hmm. um, and can you talk a little bit about what they'll learn in the class? Yeah, it's a, it's a really uh, extensive kind of class that contains 20 lessons from permitting design financing. It's nationally relevant. None of it's like jurisdiction specific. So even after you take the class, you're still going to need to do some homework, but that's kind of part of the process. And then um, there's 40 plus quick tip videos, which are like one to three minute videos that show best practices for design and construction and little things that you can't find anywhere else on the web and then interviews with homeowners and tours of ADUs of people who just built ADUs on their property. So um, it includes all that. And um, yeah. Thank you very much. In full transparency, I, I, I work, uh, work with Cole on this and then, and, and I, I get to, to benefit from introducing students to the class. I haven't taken the class myself, but I swear by this guy's knowledge. And I hope that he's shown you guys how much he knows too in this short session. Thank you so much for giving us uh, the time. Yeah, oh, go for it, please. And I just want to just mention, um, maybe Ryan, if you can send out a link to this. Um, I, I'm going to do this little series uh, next week. Um, Ryan, if you actually want to share that screen, would that be possible? Sure. Um, so Monday, starting Monday through, Monday through, Monday, April 20th through Friday, May 1st, 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. each day. We're going to be running this um, live kind of webinar series with um, subject matter experts, um, um, and it's free. Anybody can attend. Um, it's it's kind of near, more geared towards industry professionals as opposed to for homeowners. So homeowners, I wouldn't say, would necessarily find great value in this, but industry professionals will find extreme value in this. So um, sign up, check it out. It's just kind of something we're doing, kind of like what Ryan's doing here, kind of a uh, providing just a, a free opportunity for people to learn stuff during the, um, during the lockdown. Um, so um, the goal is just to kind of increase the knowledge base of the uh, uh, of practitioners out there. And you can, you can get this link at buildinganadu.com. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, please. That's a great, I'm, I'm so happy you're doing that. I'll be attending as many as I can. I saw Renee lean forward very, very quickly. Uh, and, and everybody's excited. Um, and you know, even if it's if it's primarily for professionals, if you have the time and you're interested in this stuff, um, I know some of you were, were saying at the top that you're you're more just thinking about how this affects 
housing and how this affects uh, the cities that we live in. That's, this is a great resource. Um, you're gonna get access to all kinds of really knowledgeable people and that can only help in your project and your journey. Awesome. I'm putting a link to that building in ADU, uh, ADU hour page in, in the chat as well. And all three of those I'll email out along with any other material uh, Cole wants you guys to have. Uh, anything else you want to say before we wrap it, Cole? No, that's great. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks for putting this on. And uh, good luck, everybody, with your processes. And, and go out and build ADUs.